Okay, here we are. Hello, Hello everybody. Wow, this is looking so great. We are we are still admitting people from the waiting room, but I think we can go ahead and just get started. Um, hello, <laughs> welcome to the fourth annual College of Engineering Diversity and Equity and Inclusion Summit. My name is Laverne Bitsy Baldwin. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm director for the Multicultural Engineering Program in the Carl R. Ice College of Engineering at Kansas State University. Thank you for being with us. To open our event, I'm pleased to introduce a video with Harold Wilcox, Laura Baldwin, and Victor Andrews of the Native American student body to give the KSU land acknowledgement. As the first land grant institution established under the 1862 Morrill Act, we acknowledge that the state of Kansas is, historically, home to many native nations, including the Kaw, Osage, and Pawnee, among others. Furthermore, Kansas is the current home to four federally recognized native nations, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska. Many Native nations utilized the Western Plains of Kansas as their hunting grounds, and others, such as the Delaware, were moved through this region during Indian removal efforts to make way for white settlers. It's important to acknowledge this, since the land that serves as the foundation of this institution was, and still is, stolen land. We remember these truths because K-State's status as a land-grant institution is a story that exists within ongoing settler colonialism and rests on the dispossession of indigenous peoples and nations from their lands. These truths are often invisible to many. The recognition that K-State's history begins and continues through indigenous contexts is essential. Please remember these truths because we still remember. Thank you. So we are in a pandemic. <laughs> And I definitely want to acknowledge the resilience of this community online tonight, seeking to strengthen their understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I acknowledge and applaud the Multicultural Engin Engineering Program Student Advisory Board for deciding to host a virtual event, provide goodie bags, and learn so much about Zoom. They have provided excellent leadership for tonight. So we welcome many partners who are invested in your growth and understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the engineering profession. We have keynote and alumnus, Ray Dempsey, industrial engineer. Our panelists include alumnus, Sam Brinton, mechanical and nuclear engineering. Alumnus, Danny Benavides, chemical engineering. PhD candidate, Emily Stahlbomber, mechanical engineering, and undergraduate, Jessica Weirich, computer science. Now we also have 21 professionals hosting 13 breakout sessions and representing 12 different companies. Thank you to our corporate partners tonight, BNSF Railway, BP America, Burns and McDonald, Chevron Phillips Chemical Company, Exxon Mobil, Hallmark, J.E. Dunn, Coke Industries, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Phillips 66, Textron Aviation, and the Trevor Project. The Multicultural Engineering Program Student Advisory Board has worked on organizing this event for seven months, working through the pandemic. Uh, this has brought more than 200 RSVPs for the event tonight, so we welcome you all. They have invited the Engineering Student Council Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee to be breakout session hosts along with them, and we appreciate their collaboration. Thank you, ESC. I'm proud to introduce the creative, hardworking hosts for the summit tonight, the Multicultural Engineering Program Student Advisory Board.
Sorry, I don't know what's going on. I think I had the same problem, Clint. Um, Jordan, do you have a moment? Can you share the video like you did before? Yes, let me pull it up. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Sorry about this. It's really good. So here we go. So Jordan, can you rewind it just a second and click on your share that you need to uh, include sound from the video. So if you click back out and then share you'll see that button at the bottom of the share screen. Hello, my name is Yu Tawada. Pronoun he, him, his. I'm currently a sophomore studying computer science and I am the chair position for a multicultural engineering program student advisory board. Hello, my name is Columbia Gonzalez. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a junior in computer science and I'm currently serving as the vice chair for the Multicultural Engineering Program Student Advisory Board. Hi, my name is Jordan Payton, pronouns she, her, hers. I'm currently a fifth year studying biological systems engineering and I'm also the student advisor for the Multicultural Engineering Program Student Advisory Board. Hi, my name is Jordan Ongo, pronouns he, him, his. I'm a senior in biological systems engineering I am the Engineering Student Council Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Representative. Hi, my name is Laura Baldwin, pronouns she, her, hers. I am a sophomore in computer science and I'm the representative for the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. Hello, my name is Michelle Lett and my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a sophomore in civil engineering this year as well as the president of SACE, also known as the Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers. My name is Dallas Rex, pronoun he, him, his. I am majoring in electrical engineering with a minor in computer science. I serve on the board as a representative for the National Society of Black Engineers. Hi, my name is Ezra Ruiz. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a sophomore in chemical engineering. I'm the representative for the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers for the Multicultural Engineering Program Student Advisory Board. I'm Maria Truskowski and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a senior in computer science and I represent the Diversity in Computing Club. Hi. My name is Jessica Weimer. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a freshman studying computer science, and I am the representative of the Out in STEM organization for the Multicultural Engineering Program Student Advisory Board. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to invite Dean O'Keefe to give a welcome. Well, thank you. And thank all of you for being here this evening. It's not just, um, excuse me. <laughs> my privilege to, to say welcome, but really is to say thank you. And I wanna first and foremost, thank the students for all that they have done and all that they have put in, seven months worth of work. You're doing a great job. Thank you for doing that. Also wanna thank Laverne for everything you've done and Amy Betts as well. Uh, it's been fantastic to see all that you've been able to do. Certainly all of you that are out there, welcome and for being here. We really appreciate you. We couldn't do it without you. And what a, what a turnout, over 150. This is fantastic. Our corporate sponsors, again, and participants uh, in particular, thank you for, for being here and welcome. And Ray Dempsey for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. We're really, really fortunate to have this. One of the reasons I came here, one of the reasons I was interested in this is because there was a multicultural engineering program already in place. This is not a reaction to, to what's been going on recently in our society. This is a long-term, uh, objective of, of the of the engineering college and I'm really glad to be part of that. So I don't want to take any more time. Just again, welcome. Thank you. 
and I'll turn it over to you two for, for doing the introductions. All right. Uh, thank you, Laverne Betsy Baldwin, for all you uh, all you do to support us. Uh, without you, this won't be possible. And thank you, Dean O'Keefe, for also being here with us tonight. And I would like you, I would like now to introduce Mr. Ray Dempsey, our keynote speaker, the Chief Diversity Officer for BP America. Mr. Dempsey is from Wichita, Kansas, and alum alumnus from our very own Carl R. Ice College of Engineering with Bachelor of Science in Industrial Engineering. Uh, after graduating, he became an engineering at AMCO. Then after a couple of years in the industry, he obtained his MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg Graduate School of Management. Between that time and now, he has a long list of accomplishments that includes being an A, named as one of the most influential Blacks in corporate America in 2016, a past chair, <clears throat> a past chairman of the board of directors for the National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering. Also, he currently sits on the board for National Urban League, the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Foundation and Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute, while being a member of Executive Board, <clears throat> Executive Leadership Council, ELC, the permanent, permanent uh, membership organization for the development of global black leaders and the board of directors for our K-State Foundation. <clears throat> With that being said, I am pleased to welcome Ray Dempsey as our keynote speaker. Udo, thank you for the, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Laverne, for the invitation. It's an honor to be with you tonight. Uh, thank you, Dean O'Keefe. We haven't yet met, but I, I look forward to it. Someday we'll have a chance to, to do things face to face again, and I look forward to spending some time. Um, it, it is an honor to be with you, and, and honestly, I was I was delighted to get the invitation. And truth be told, I'll I'll do just about anything you all ask of me. I I have such a love and affection for Kansas State University, and especially the the Carl R. Ice College of Engineering. Um, I was you thirty some years ago, uh, as as was said. I'm an, I was an undergraduate student at Kansas State. I graduated thirty years ago this year um, in 1990. And I have such fond memories. I, I still get to spend quite a bit of time working with and in support of, of the university. Um, I, I have to say that um, Dr. Brad Kramer, the, the head of IMSC, um, apparently, or at least allegedly, has some photos of a, of a young person that, that sort of looks like me. I'm, I'm just, I want to let you all know in advance, in case those start moving around, that it's a hoax. It's clearly not me. That person has a lot of hair. I, I clearly do not, at least not on my head. <laughs> um, and, and just as a fair warning, um, my roommate, who allegedly is the source of these photos, well, I've got some much more entertaining um, photos of him from, from way back. And, and those just might find their way into circulation too. I, I couldn't help but throw that in. I, I wanna spend some time with you this evening really talking about just three ideas and we'll do that pretty fast and hopefully we'll spend a few minutes um, getting the chance to do some Q&A with all of you. Um, but this topic, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it is, it's a big deal these days. Um, there is a lot of conversation, a lot of, of engagement on this topic. It's, it's my day job as the Chief Diversity Officer for BP America. And I, I just think it's useful when we start a conversation now about what, what's going on and why it matters so much to, to take, a, take a few steps back and, and just try to put it all into some perspective. I, I wanna talk with you briefly about why are we still talking about this? Why is this work so hard? I wanna share my perspective about what it is that makes this so important to corporations. Um, and things that you might want to think about as you prepare to move um, from school to, to industry or some other, other way of work. I want to give you some of my perspective then on, so what are we doing, at least in, in my company, to try to make progress in this space? And then I'll pause and hopefully I will have provoked you and made you think and hopefully you'll have some, some questions. So first, 
why are we still talking about this? It's 2020 and diversity, equity, inclusion may be more in the front of our minds than at any time since the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Why is this such hard work? I think in order to, to really tackle that question, you've got to, you've got to rewind the clock quite a long way. And the way I often think about it is I, I put the history of black people in our country um, in, in a frame that, that goes all the way back to the, let's say 1619. That's a date where there's loads of documentation of the arrival of slaves in Jamestown, Virginia. Um, some feel really strongly that that was the first landing, the first arrival of slaves in the US. Others think that no, there, it, it happened well earlier and there's, there's some bits of evidence some debate whether or not it was actually Jamestown as the first port, but I'll set outside all those debates for now for purposes of this illustration. And let's just, let's just agree that 1619, Jamestown, Virginia is when the history of black people in America began. You'll all know, of course, that for the first 250 some years of that history, until 1865, we were in the construct of slavery in the United States. And while the Emancipation Proclamation was, was signed in 1865, some say that it wasn't until 1868, three whole years later on, on Juneteenth, um, when the news of the Emancipation Proclamation reached the furthest edges of the Confederacy in Texas. And at that point, all of those who had been enslaved were, were free. In some ways, you could argue that that should have been a big change, but, but there's, there's more to our story. And indeed, it was a whole hundred years later, um, in 1964, that the Civil Rights Act was passed, and, and the year later, the Voting Rights Act. Those two were preceded by about a decade uh, by the landmark Supreme Court case, Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education, which, which made segregation um, no longer legal. But then the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act went further to, to make even more rights clear and, and connected to those in our African-American community. So what I want you to think about is here we are now more than 300 plus years into this history of black people in America. And for all of that time, without debate, without dispute, we lived in America where it wasn't about racist attitudes or racist behaviors. It wasn't about bias and discrimination as, as sort of the, just the way that people operated, it was the law. It was the law of the land. And we can stretch the history even further beyond the, the peak of the civil rights movement in the 60s and indeed into the 70s and even into the 80s, there was an awful lot of legislation at the state and local level that still provided for the legal protection, the legal provision for bias and discrimination. So again, it wasn't just about attitudes and behaviors. It was the law of the land. Now, what makes that important is the way I'll, I'll summarize the math. Because if we started this clock in 1619 and we go all the way to 1980, what that says is that for 90%, almost 90% of the history of Black people in our country, it was within a legal context of bias and discrimination. That's a long time and many generations um, to have endured. And it's, it's a change attitudinally, behaviorally, and in our systems that will take time to change. We've been hard at it. And indeed, no doubt there's been progress made. But the events of this year um, and the, the massive tipping point that I believe the murder of George Floyd became is in some ways a sign of, of even more progress to come. I wanted to put that into that historical context because the tipping points of early this summer have really made an impact in corporate America. Um, I, I really do see change and, and an impact in my company that's different than it has been in all of the 30 years that I've been in industry. So let's think for a few minutes then now about, well, why does this matter so much to corporations? I, I think there's three simple reasons and there's, there's loads of evidence, and if we had hours, I could I could spend lots of time giving you lots of references and things to go 
to go refer to, but I'm going to summarize and just hit a few high points. The first big reason this matters so much to corporations in the US and indeed around the world is about performance. There's loads of studies that have been done. There's, there's research and data that points very clearly to the reality that companies that are more diverse, more equitable, and more inclusive perform better. There's the landmark research um, produced by McKinsey in 2015, which though now a bit dated and many, many others have come beyond, um, it still is cited often as the landmark groundbreaking piece of research that, that really tied in a, in a, in a clear way uh, the performance gained by companies that are more diverse and more inclusive. And when it comes down to it, that performance is, is not just about collaboration, it's not just about innovation, it's fundamentally about the, the outcomes, the financial performance. And so put simply, companies that are more diverse, more equitable, more inclusive, they make more money. That's a motivator. The second point then is what I call license to operate. And in my company, there's lots of ways that I often share this, this idea. License to operate just means that those people who are in a position to make decisions about your ability to be in the business that you're in, about your ability to go to market, and indeed, ultimately, the stakeholders, the customers who make choices about whether or not they're going to be part of your enterprise, those things shape what I call this license to operate. And in ways that are changing, even, even every day, the people who are making those decisions in my industry, for my company, and, and even more broadly, are increasingly from communities of difference. Um, it's not just about race. It certainly isn't just about gender. Those two things we pay a lot of attention to in the corporate world, but it goes well beyond. And those differences are increasingly things that people expect us to be able to talk about, to have clear strategies and plans and, and, and efforts underway to, to make improvements. And in the end, they'll hold us to account. And what I say often is a company today who cultivates the reputation and the identity as being one that really fully embraces the value of diversity and equity and inclusion, um, all those people in positions to make decisions, whether that's about issuing permits permits, or, or, or approving transactions or, or agreeing to, to buy products and services, they'll, they'll notice that choice to embrace and they'll keep it in mind when it's time for them to make their choices. And by contrast, companies who do not cultivate a reputation and identity as one that is committed to and embraces the value of diversity, equity, inclusion, well, those same communities will notice that too. And they'll make a note and it'll be a factor when it comes time for them to make decisions that affect our ability to be in the business that we're in. That's a powerful motivator. And then the last of these three points is essentially about talent. It's about you. It's about the ability of our company, our industry, um, to attract people like you to want to come and join our company and to build and grow career and, and to stay. The demographic change in the United States is pretty unique. Um, I work in a global company and I have a chance to work alongside colleagues in Asia Pacific, all the way in Singapore and China and Australia and New Zealand and, and through the Middle East and Africa and all across Europe and, and then in the Western Hemisphere and Latin America and the Caribbean and, and indeed here in the US and, and Canada. And, and what I understand, what I hear from them all is that this challenge of thinking about who's this next generation of our talent, who are we trying to recruit, what do they think? How do they feel and, and what is it about who we are that makes them want to be part of our enterprise and the rapidly changing demographics in the US in particular stand out. And I want to use an example to, to illustrate that for you it's it's the story of Houston, Texas. Um, I think some of you know how to raise your hand I don't see that button on the bottom of my zoom screen, um, but let me ask a question real fast and if you can find the raise your hand button. Just, just hit it so I can get a sense of how many of you there are from Houston, Texas. Anybody here on, on the call today who is from Houston, Texas? I see the chat box lighting up. Maybe that's where that shows up. Well, I can't tell how many of you have answered, but let me tell you why I asked and what this story is about. My company has worked for a long time with a a researcher, a demographer at the Kinder Institute at Rice University. 
His name's Dr. Steven Kleinberg, and he's been doing a demographic study of Houston for more than 38 years. He knows everything about the changing demographics of Houston. And even alongside the, the demographic data, he's also done a, an attitude survey to evaluate how Houstonians feel about the changing demographics in their city. And there was a data point, it's almost two years old now that I, I still I still think about often and I share it and I like to challenge groups when I get a chance to talk to groups just like this. And it's, it's about the proportion of young people in Houston who are those who we've always in the United States described as minorities. So think about this, of all the young people in Houston, Texas today, not in 2030 or 2040 or 2050, but today, of all the young people in Houston under age 19, what percentage of them do you think are people that in the United States we've always described as minorities? I should sing the Jeopardy song while you're thinking about that. It's, it's interesting. I've asked this question many times, perhaps even in a previous conversation with some of you on, on the university campus. But I've gotten answers over the years or over the, the times I've asked this that range from as little as 25%, some people have guessed 25% of every young person in Houston today under 19 is someone we've always described as a minority. Um, it, it ranges up, sometimes goes up to 50, 55%. Um, I've heard people who get bold and they say 60, 65, even 70%. So you've got a number in your minds. Um, don't cheat, we're gonna, we're gonna do the test now. So of all the young people in Houston, Texas today, under age 19, 51% are Hispanic or Latino, and 19% are African American, and 13% are Asian. And with a little rounding in the tenths, that is 84%. 84% of every young person in Houston, Texas today is someone, uh, under age 19, is someone that we've always in the United States described as a minority. Why does this matter? Well, Houston is my company's single largest workplace in the world. We have more people uh, in BP in Houston, Texas than we do anywhere else in the world. It's the energy capital of the world. And so a, a, a big driver of, of the thinking and the ideas of, of our industry. And indeed, we don't recruit just from Houston, Texas, but there's an awful lot of people who will be in the industry and in our workforce who come from Houston, Texas. And so if we miss the reality that the people from whom we will draw our source of talent in just the very next generation will be dramatically different from the representation that we see in our company today. And if we don't act with urgency to make sure that we're a company that, that those people want to join, that they want to be part of, that they want to build careers in, then it's game over. In, in less than two decades, we're out of business. We will not have sufficient talent to get work done. We will have to think completely differently about our presence in the United States. And while Houston matters a lot to my company and my industry, Dr. Kleinberg, the demographer, has extended his research and has, has looked at similar trends well beyond Houston. He's, he's examined essentially every major metro in the United States, from New York to Chicago to Los Angeles. And the same trends are true there. Even the next tier of major cities, whether it's Atlanta and Philadelphia and, and Denver and, um, and Seattle, they, they have the same trends too. The proportions are a bit different. The makeup of, of which groups are the, the largest are, are different, but the, the expectation that this group of people that we've always described as minority will soon be the significant majority in those workforces is true. And that's why almost every demographic study you see, even the US Census Bureau itself, um, asserts that the United States, the entire country will be majority minority by, by 2050 and some say by much sooner. This makes this an urgent challenge. It's not just a good thing to do. It's not just the right thing to do. It's a business imperative in ways that matter in the way that we perform in the way that we preserve and secure our license to operate, and in the way that we can attract the right talent that we need to compete into the future. So with that as a backdrop, this is why we're still in this conversation. The history of our country says that there's still a lot of work to do. 
Um, there's three reasons why this matters a lot to corporations and indeed why I, I feel we're at a tipping point in, in this year following the tragic events of earlier in the summer. Um, so here's what we're doing at BP to make progress. Um, we, we launched a series of what I called listening lounges in my company in early June. Um, I sent a note off to my chief executive on May 30th and suggested that he should speak. We had to communicate to our entire global workforce about the urgency um, of, of the challenge. And he did. And on June 1, there was a note to all, you, all employees around the world, all 75,000 BP employees everywhere that we operate. And two days later, we launched a series of what we called listening lounges that invited colleagues to share stories of their experiences about being black in America, being black in their communities, um, being black in BP. And some of them were just gut-wrenching and, and, and deeply emotional. Um, people shared things that were intimate and personal and it made an enormous impact on, on our entire company. It led us to a, a real deep sense of conviction that we had to act. It wasn't enough to just now have this, this new sense of understanding and this deep empathy, but we had to act. And we made a choice to not just quickly issue a statement like many companies did that condemned racial injustice and, and, and set, set out their, their lofty expectations for a better America. Um, no, we, we decided that we had to go further and we spent some time doing not just the listening, but, but, but doing some, some action planning. And we engaged communities, groups, individuals around the country and indeed outside the US. And we launched in August what we call our framework for action. It's got three key pillars. Uh, it's fundamentally a simple idea, but it says that we have to be committed to driving equity um, everywhere that we are in the world. And indeed, we, we will have launched this framework, not just in the US and in the UK, but everywhere in the world that we operate. And it's based on three key pillars. The first is transparency. Um, we've collected data um, in, in my team for a long time. We share it with our most senior leaders. We, we use it to think about the right approach, the right focus, but we haven't been very good about sharing it more broadly, whether inside our company and, and, and outside. And we've made a commitment now that we'll start to produce a comprehensive diversity and inclusion report in April 2021 alongside our annual corporate report and our sustainability report. That transparency, we believe, will, will help to build real understanding of where we are, um, what progress we've made, what gaps we still have, and what we are doing to close them. It'll also lead to the second of these three pillars in a powerful way, and that second pillar is accountability. Something I say often is that my company, BP, we, we have the very, very best intentions. We've had the best intentions around diversity for all the time that I've been in the company. If you go to our website, you'll see, you'll see really great words. You'll see fantastic aspiration about aspirations about who we want to be as a company. But where we have fallen short, like many others, is in creating the accountability structure that ensures that we deliver on those good intentions, just like we must in every other critical area of our business, whether that's safety or production or ultimately financial performance. And now we are. In our framework for action, we've made a commitment that we are going to link the way that we measure performance for leaders at every level throughout the organization with ultimately then a linkage, a direct linkage to compensation. And it'll be tied to real progress and commitment in our performance in diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're working really hard to be careful about those metrics. We don't want to just create a system where everybody tries to game it and tick the box, but it'll lead to real constructive and qualitative and quantitative results that move things forward for, for BP. The third pillar is talent, and not surprisingly, it's focused on people like you. And it's about ensuring that we go out with intent to create the organization and the workforce that we say we want, that we then support the development and the progression of everybody who comes into our company all the way to the highest levels of their potential. One of the things that I've, I've said about the way we recruit NBP for too long is that as it relates to our diversity ambitions, we, we simply have held what I call a strategy of hope, meaning we go to great schools, great institutions, and it's many of them that we, we visited for a long time, and we hope that somehow we'll start to get different 
kinds of talent uh, as a result. And that hasn't worked really well. And the commitment we've made now is we're going to move with intent to recruit, to identify, attract, and then recruit the talent um, of all the dimensions of diversity that matter to us and in the places where they are. And a critical component of that, you might not be surprised, is we'll, we'll really double down on some relationships with historically Black colleges and universities in the United States. And we're, we're optimistic, we're hopeful, we're determined that that'll be a big part of the progress that we'll make. I'm proud of this framework for action. The 11 points in it are not just about expressions of good intentions. They're about dramatically changing the way that we approach work, the way that we build into our systems and our processes, the way that we support people, and ultimately about ensuring that this great future that we've always envisioned of being a more diverse, more equitable, more inclusive company actually comes to life. So I said I want to talk about just those three things, a little bit of the history and the context as to why we're still in this conversation, why it's so hard, a little bit about why it matters so much to corporations and indeed what it is that we're doing at BP. I hope I've made you think, I hope I've provoked you, and I hope I've, I've challenged you to perhaps um, think about what your role can be in this activity as you prepare to move into the workforce. And while I don't know how much time we have left, I'll, I'll ask for some help on that. I hope there's time for me to, to hear from you and try to answer some of your questions. Uh, so Ray, I'll go ahead and answer that. We've got about 10 minutes awesome. for questions. So I'm, I'm gonna try, I've got actually quite a few coming in here. So I'm gonna um, try and pick um, two or three for them. So the first one I'm going to ask, um, this is from, Brian Hill, um, and he's the Nesby president. And one of the things he asked, and I'm kind of interested in this too, because it actually turns out we've got a lot of um, former engineers that are chief diversity officers. So how did you get involved with diversity and inclusion um, from engineering? Could you speak a little bit more about that pathway after college? Yeah, that's Brian who asked. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Amy. So Brian, it's a great question. and. Actually, it's a story I tell often, um, mostly inside my company, because I have been here for 30 years. Lots of people know of me. They know of other places in our company that I've worked, which ranges from real engineering. <laughs> I really was an engineer for, for, for a pretty good while. And I've worked in a lot of financial areas and strategy and retail. I ran a region of gas stations, actually, in, in the Atlanta, Georgia area. I've, I've lived in London on two different occasions, which is our world headquarters. Um, I even worked in HR for a while at, at my request, which some people found a surprise. But the way I found myself in diversity, equity, inclusion is, is actually pretty interesting. I, I was in Washington, D.C., where I still live, in fact, as the head of external affairs. I, I did that for many years, actually. And I, I was part, while well, in that role, I was part of our, our diversity council, which is a group of our most senior leaders, business and functional leaders around the country. And somebody came into that council meeting in 2016, early 2016, and showed some data and concluded from the data they shared with us that we were doing great, that everything was fine at BP. And as I tell the story, I, I didn't quite flip over the table, uh, but I flipped out, I suppose. I, I reacted to that and I, I, I said that that was wrong and we were kidding ourselves, in fact, we, we were completely missing the realities of some things because of the way we looked at the data. And I, I challenged the group who brought it in to go back and to disaggregate certain parts of the data, to look at some different dimensions, and, and then to come back and talk to us again. And my boss at the time, the chairman and president of BP America, he didn't quite know why I was so freaked out, um, but he, he endorsed my request. And they went and they did the research and, and recut the numbers and they came back in later in the year. And I was right. Uh, there were some real challenges for the way that people of many dimensions of difference were able to cultivate and manage and, and progress in their careers in our company. So I was very, very happy sitting in my, my very nice office in Washington, DC. And uh, my boss asked me, well, what do you think we should do? And I wrote a two page paper outlining what I believed was what BP should really commit to if we were serious about making progress in diversity and inclusion. And um, after that paper, I found myself in short order in conversations with our, our global head of HR and, 
and the chairman and president and, and ultimately found myself in a new job. Now that belies the truth that for many years, maybe all the way back to the time that I joined, I was part of diversity groups and diversity conversations. I've always had an interest, but I, I only took on the responsibility for driving it after I essentially told the company that we weren't being bold, we weren't being determined, and we weren't being clear enough about the commitments that we were prepared to make. And, and they agreed. And so I find myself here now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. So I'm going to actually try and merge a few questions because I'm getting some questions on a similar track. So I have actually some students who are asking about how do you start and have some of these conversations in your workplace or with your professional colleagues? And then I actually have some corporate and alumni members who are asking, how do you make people feel safe speaking up? about issues. Um, so I, I think these are kind of related and, and how do you really create those safe spaces for those dialogues, but then how um, can people go about really having these sort of um, civil and constructive discussions? You know, it's a great question. And we, my team managed to do this beautifully um, and I can't take the credit, but there are, there are a few things that we learned that we had to put into place to, to provide the right context for, for real exchange, real learning, real sharing, and, and ultimately real empathy. We, we did these listening lounges that I told you about, and those actually became really big groups. In the end, we, we managed to touch over 6,000 people um, over the course of just a couple of weeks in these listening lounges. So it, it, it turned out to be a, a massive exercise, uh, much more than we expected. But we entered into it with just a couple of simple, clear guidelines. This was not a debate. This was not the kind of a conversation where any person's input was subject to debate or, or even commentary. The only thing that we, we, we said was okay to do after we heard from any of our colleagues was to acknowledge what, what we heard um, to, to honor their courage and to, and to commit to, to continuing to, to listen and learn. We made it clear that this was not a problem solving exercise. And in a company of engineers, that's a hard thing. We're used to you know, hearing about challenges and immediately moving into problem solving mode. But those conversations weren't about fixing anything. They were simply about listening and learning. We made it clear that anyone was invited to speak. And indeed, while many of the stories shared were from African-American colleagues, there were some extraordinarily powerful stories told by, by some allies. Um, one of them, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget it, it was a, a, a young white man who lives in Colorado. He's a hiker and he likes to go on, on hikes in the, in the mountains. And I'll tell this really fast because I, I know I want to get to some other questions, but I'd, I'd love for you to hear this. He, he decided that he needed a face mask because Denver's pretty sunny and he, he was always putting on sunscreen and it was always washing off. So he bought before COVID, before masks were cool, he bought himself a face mask, a dark face mask. He also decided he wanted a weighted vest because he liked the additional exercise value and he found a camouflage one, he said, and he thought it looked cool, so he bought it. And so one day he set off to go on a hike and to get to the trailhead, he had to walk past a school and someone noticed and they called the police. And they, they told the police that a bald headed white man with a face mask and a camouflage vest was walking by the school and they didn't know if he was up to some sort of no good. So remarkably, a bunch of police responded quickly, maybe not remarkably in that context. Um, so as he told the story, three or four cars arrived in, while he was still in the vicinity of the school and they started to give him instructions. He, he was completely confused. He had no idea what in the world was going on and why they were stopping him on his walk. Um, but they started to give him instructions like, stand where you are, show us your hands, don't reach for anything, don't reach into your pockets. And he disregarded their instructions. In fact, he walked towards the officers. He eventually reached into his pocket, pulled out his wallet, opened his wallet, took out his ID. And as he was speaking to the officer saying, hey, I don't know what's going on. I'm just, you know, my name's so-and-so. I'm just going for a hike, here's my ID. They took his ID from him, they went and they checked him out and they said, yep, he's just a guy going for a walk and they let him go on his way. Later that night, as he told his story, he reflected that if he weren't white, he might be dead. 
the choices he made in that context and the circumstances of his experience as he listened to those of other people what for him was a stark reminder that actually there's something different here that I didn't appreciate until now. And so I retell that story. I hope it was quick enough because I'd, I'd like you to appreciate that what we what we offered was this is not about um, debate or negotiation. It's not about response. So it, this is your opportunity to say what you need to say in a way that hopefully feels like it's it's good for your soul. It's not about fixing anything. We weren't all going to chip in and immediately try to solve these problems. We were just going to listen and learn. And anybody is welcome. We honored those rules and it just had a powerful effect. So that may not be specific enough for everybody who's asking. And I, I invite anybody who has more specifics they'd like to explore about this to, to reach out to me. I'll make sure my contact details are available and I'm happy to have longer discussions. Thank you so much. So I'm, I'm gonna ask another, I'm gonna do it again. I'm sort of grouping some together. Um, so can you talk about when a lot of the young people on this call today are either looking for jobs, they're gonna be looking for jobs or internships in the future. What are some things they should be looking at and what are some questions they should be asking um, when they're applying for jobs and looking for a future career? Yeah, I really believe culture is a big part of what must be explored when you're looking for a job. And sometimes it's the hardest thing to get a real, real strong feeling about. Um, everybody's got a website these days. Um, we, we didn't have that when I was coming out of school in 1990, but it, it helps to spend some time examining, you know, who they say they are, what they say matters most. I'd look not just though for those words, but for evidence. How do the companies show up in the communities that you that you know and that you care about? Uh, my company has made a massive commitment just earlier this year to reinvent ourselves. We are we are focused now on getting to net zero by 2050 or sooner, and and we're now therefore leading into this lower carbon energy economy. We we used to say that we know it's coming and we think it's great, but we're not just watching and waiting now. We are leading into it. So I, I share that because if there's something that's important to you, whether it's the environment or, or climate, whether it's um, community commitment and, and social efforts, if, if those things matter to you, there's, there's a great opportunity now to really explore those things as you're, as you're looking at companies. And, and something I do often, even, even now when I'm working with other companies is I don't just read the website. I don't just ask the leaders. I, I ask everybody. I ask questions about what goes on here, what, what really shows up in the, the manifestations of culture, the, the artifacts of what the leaders really, really not just what they say, but what they really do are often seen and felt and heard all the way through the organization. And my encouragement, especially given the resources now and the opportunity to kind of reach out and engage, whether it's online or on social media or indeed just with the companies is to, to take full advantage of that. Okay, so I think I'm going to do one last question and breakout rooms are starting soon. So if people need to go, um, but if you can go without a break between this and the breakout room, you can stay for this one last question. Um, so you, you talked about you could be listening lounges and I have a question related to what are some of the noticeable changes that you've seen? Because you, you have noticed that there are changes. So you could speak a little bit more about that. But also, could you speak about when things can't get changed right away? You know, what, what can you do in the meantime? And so what can you do with some of those emotions that we feel when change is taking a long time? Yeah, I think I'll start at the back of that, Amy, and then work, work forward because there are some things that we know are going to be persistent challenges. Um, and one of them relates to just how fast you'll see really big differences in the representation of of workforces in, in my company, in my industry, and, and maybe even more distressing is the, the pace of change at the very top. There, there is a, a reality, no doubt, that women and minorities have for a very long time been underrepresented in, in STEM disciplines, especially engineering. That's a big part of the commitment that I've had for a long time to, to NACME, um, which was referred to in my introduction. I, I was a NACME scholar when I was an undergraduate student there at K-State and got to work on the NACME board for many years and, and was the chair 
um, for a couple of years, just, just at the end of last year, I, I, I moved out of that role. And so they've been doing work for a long time, 46, 47 years and trying to create an engineering workforce that looks like America. And as long as that work's been going on, the, the underrepresentation persists. And so there will still be challenges in how fast we'll see our workforce really truly reflect the, the fundamental demographics and, and population of, of those cities and those places in which we have a presence. But we're, we're working hard at it. So if that's the, the, the thing that will be hardest to change, uh, the changes that I see have to do, especially now, with a real commitment uh, and particularly based on the framework that we launched in my company, a commitment to not just aspiring to be better, but to building in the processes and the systems and the metrics that will ensure that we are better just as in the same way that we do every other fundamental key driver in our business and our business performance. That matters so much because we've talked about diversity for all the time I've been in the company. And, and I've been through some periods, some great ups and downs where there's an emphasis and more resource and then industry conditions get tough and, and the resources kind of turn down and the emphasis seems to turn down. But by building it into the fundamental way that we work to, to our core people processes, um, to the way that we measure and manage the performance of leaders and parts of the company all the way through at every level, that will ensure that this is sustained change. And the commitment to do it was felt this year in a way that I haven't seen it in all the years that I've been um, out of Kansas State University. So it does feel to me like a real tipping point. I hope it feels that way to you when you all join the workforce. Thank you very much. So the breakout sessions are ongoing. So people feel free to leave and go to the breakout session. We will see everyone back at the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you.